don't waste your time with with people who love beer. He always used to say that. Don't don't be going out socialising, wasting time with 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 nobodies. Surround yourself with. Shit, you'll become. It's one of the things he'd say to you. There's one person in that room, in that kitchen, that just stands out from the crowd. This particular chef messes around, last one in, first one out. But at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock, that particular chef became a cooking machine of pure focus and adrenaline. And he said, people like that, focus on them and go with them. And that was Gordon Ramsay. His point was, why do you want to come back to Southport when you're working in the best kitchen, one of the best kitchens in, in the country, if not best hotel in the world? What, what, what do you go and work back at Skagebury? And at that point, right, if your dad had said, listen, son, get on the train, come back home, we'll cook you a dinner, maybe it isn't for you, would you have gone? No. No, I don't think so. Because then I'd know that I was just, I'd given up. I don't think I would have gone. I was scared stiff down here really? and homesick. But no, there's just something about giving in just doesn't quite appeal to me, even from that young age. And I don't know where that came from. I think that's just, I loved, you know, my, my, my brother never has worked or been to the places I've been to, but there's a drive in Brian that, I, again, I don't see in many people. And that, you know, just watching him on a bag in a gym, watching him row, a, you know, on a machine for an hour is 50. He ate my brother and he could put people to shame in the gym. He just doesn't give up. He could do 10 three minute rounds on a bag with a minute break and then go on the rowing machine for 45 minutes to an hour, sweat like you wouldn't believe, but he'd get off and say that I'm the fittest 58 year old you ever meet. And I stand by that and he was always like that. And I love that about him. So I just fed off that. Yeah. These are dy they're dynamos. These two people are dynamos for me and I just feed off them and give me energy. But if we go back to your dad and his influence, so I get the ex like the leading by example that you see in him grafting all hours. What's the kind of nuggets of advice that he was giving you that gave you that grittiness to get through? Don't give up, work hard, be a good person, um, and look after look after your money. You know, look after yourself. You know, look after what you do. If you're going to work that hard, don't throw it all away. Don't be going down the pub and bevying it up or getting you know all the things he used to say don't be going for going out and buying everyone around a drink see the wages that you work so hard he said if you want to go out have a, have a drink and then get out go on don't waste your time with with people who love beer he always used to say that don't don't be going out socializing and and wasting time with 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 nobodies surround yourself with shite you'll become shite was one of the things he'd say to you and that you know he's right and I, and I, and I, and I think he's, I love that about him. He's, you know, he's, he's very direct and very coarse, but I think it's who I am. It's, it's, it's what's inside me. It's, it's what's under my skin. So you find yourself going into these kitchens and where you're at the lowest level. So to take your dad's lessons that you're at the shite level, how did you identify, I want to get to the next level? Like, did you go and hang around with like chefs that were far ahead of you to go and pick their brains? Oh. No, never. I saw one or two in the kitchen that I'd say, I'm going to get to where you are. And I'd, I'd pinpoint a couple of people that I wanted to get to their level before I left that kitchen. And I, I would identify them as you know as soon as I walked into the kitchen. And what would you do, though, to learn from them? Just watch them. Simple as that. Look at them, watch them, make sure they're doing what you like, see what they're all about, take what they've got on the table and add it to your arsenal of, of information. And so... Stack it up, get it into the, into you know, make it your own, stick it on a shelf, train, 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 so take that information, that work ethic and, and stick it on a shelf. And then one day when you become a head chef, you get it all down and then you make your own mark on the industry. So give us an example of like one of the early characteristics you'd have identified that you there's then only one, There's only use. really one person that stands out for me. <laughs> and that was, um, so I, work, I came to London, I worked at the Savoy. Um, I did just just under two years, and before the end, I felt like I'd done my time, uh, and I wanted. I set that day, and I said to Dad, "I don't really know where to go next." I said, "But there is one kitchen I really remember from a TV show called Takes Its Cooks, um, and it was about six of the greatest chefs in, in in the UK at that particular time, and one of them was Albert Rue Le Gavroche." I said, "Dad, that's where we want to go. From a five star hotel to a three star Michelin is like flying from North Pole to South Pole. Yeah, completely different places, both cold." Both got a pole, but go both completely different for for different reasons, and that's what that's what came next. He said, "Well, 
well, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, well, I'm, I'm off tomorrow. He said, right, I want, you to do me, I want you to do me a favour. He said, I want you to get up, have a shower, have a shave, put your best suit on if you've got one, get a jacket on and go and knock on their door. I said, Dad, you can't do that. He said, mate, will you just do that for me? I was like, <laughs> that's Gavroche, mate. I, I can't go and knock on the Gavroche door. He said, will you just fucking do it? Do it for me and see what happens next. So I did it. Knocked on the door. Michelle didn't come up. The head chef came up, uh, Mark Prescott, who happened to be from Wigan. So he's a northerner like me. He gave me time. I told him what I wanted. Two weeks later, I got a letter in the post offering me a job. Wow. I handed my notice in the Savoy. Anton Edelman laughed at me and said, you won't survive. And there was the feed. That was, that was just what I needed. There was the, the fodder for me to feed off because that chef said to me, that kitchen's too tough for you and you won't survive in there. So I thought, okay, I've loved working at Savoy, but I'm going anyway, because you don't, you don't pass that up. So what was the person I met? I walked in that kitchen on my very first day, I got walked to the vegetable section, and there was a French chef there, and Michel introduced himself. He took me over there and said, you're gonna be working with this chef. In a week, he's gonna be leaving this section. Oh, by the way, he doesn't speak a word of English, he's French. Off you go. <laughs> Here we go. And I put my head down. I was given the section after a week and I, I entered Hell's Kitchen from, in my mind. And yet it was the most organized, perfect kitchen I'd ever worked in. It's beautiful. But I just got, took a job that I wasn't ready for. And I survived. That day I went home. I called my dad. He said, right, lad, what do you think? What was it like? I said, unbelievable. It's clean. It's the service, the food, Michelle, Gavroche, mate. Brilliant. I said, but there's one person in that room, in that kitchen, that just stands out from the crowd, who's completely different from anyone else. This particular chef messes around, last one in, first one out, but at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock, that particular chef became a cooking machine of pure focus and adrenaline. I said, that chef stands out from the other 23 chefs in the kitchen, even more so than Michel Roux. And he said, people like that, watch, watch them, focus on them and go with them. And that was Gordon Ramsay. Big change in my life that because he was a game changer in that kitchen. And obviously he became a game changer in my career because that was the chef that stood out from any other chef I'd ever worked with. Out of all the 110 chefs in the Savoy. And stood out in what way? Were you in awe of him, impressed by him, confused by him, because you weren't going out and clubbing and partying and dancing and having fun and then cooking. You were Mr. Single-Minded Determination, right? I was the opposite to him. Yeah. He was that. And Gordon was a people person. And he really had a star quality when it came to the food. I used to, he'd just spent three and a half years with Marco White at Harvey's, the rock and roll kitchen, the, the kitchen that was unlike no other in anywhere in this country that had ever seen, anyone had ever seen before. And so he came into Gavroche with that training, that tasting, that attention to detail, that perfection on the cutting of the fish, that brilliance of putting food on the plate, taste, taste, taste. You look around the kitchen, people weren't tasting food, they would just go through a process. And that's the one thing that was a point of difference. So that was when I say focused on him, I added that into my arsenal. Just kept adding and adding and adding and just loved it. And mimic it, because he was mimicking Marco. But Marco was, a, I never had the chance to work with Marco. That kitchen I was not ready for. So I went into Gavroche and saw someone who, who then left and then went to Paris. And strangely enough, we met up three years later uh, and I became the very first chef that he ever employed at, at the Aubergine. And before we talk about life at the Aubergine with Gordon Ramsay, there's a great conversation here for people that feel that they're thrown into the deep end all the time and either self-doubt or imposter syndrome is the old enemy that creeps up and stops them in their tracks. You managed to, you either didn't have them, or if you did have them, you managed to quell them and keep them quiet. Yeah. So what advice would you give to people for whom the self-doubt just sometimes can be crippling and, and what you did at that period find, to get through that? Find, find someone to lean on. You've yeah. got to find someone to talk to. You need to find, but whoever you find, whoever that person is in your life, you make sure that that person is a rock. So that rock that you can't budge, that you can lean on, that you can that can support you, don't find someone that's like you or someone that is, has failed before. Find someone. It could be a teacher. It could be a lecturer. It could be an aunt and uncle. It could be a granny, granddad. Someone in your life, if there is one, 
If it's not someone that you know, go and, f go and find a book. And who was it for you then? Was it still the phone calls to your 100%. dad? 100%, oh yeah. I'd never got through the aubergine without, without him. And how, how was he so wise for a guy that sold fruit he had and potatoes? No, he had no clue what world I was in. No clue. But isn't that naivety in some ways is the, is the magic, huh? That is the magic. That's the key. Basic values of life don't change, no matter how rich, how tall, how high you are, how big you think you are. Basic value is still there. It's called foundation. This building we're standing, we're sitting in right here is built on a foundation. This building could have been one story tall or 38 stories tall. It could have been even higher. But if the foundation is weak and soft and breakable, this building will collapse. And I think that's the same in us. Hey guys, it's Jake here. Listen, before you go, please do me just one favor. Hit subscribe. It makes such a difference to us. The more subscribers we get, then the bigger the channel becomes. The bigger the channel becomes, the bigger the names we can attract and the more impact we can have for you. So thanks for watching and please subscribe right now.